location. Um, some of the things we visited is just trying to keep close to the idea that um, there's some, some undercurrents, some real fundamental ideas that we need to hold close to when viewing any of the material that's going to come across during the semester. And some of them are these assumptions that we make about the world, particularly through um, our you know, faith traditions and wisdom traditions, but also in ways that social science reinforces. And so one of those was, do you remember what one, one was the last time that I mentioned? It's kind of like a very terse comment. I was saying, one thing, this deeper truth that these things all point to is the fact that all is one. Exactly. Thank you, Todd. Right, and so there's this inherent unity in existence, in the universe, in, our, in creation. And there's, you know, our faith traditions point to the force behind that. Um, and you can find that in many, many ways that, that, that we understand to be of the divine nature of the world. But um, one of the things that we're going to discover when we talk about certain leadership is its relationship to that, its causal to that. Um, our task today is pretty simple. We're going to outline some definitions and terms that will be key for us to understand as we move forward through the semester and even the following semesters and kind of understand the particular twist that we have uh, in understanding what it means to be a servant leader. Jenna last time talked about the fact that one of the key things in the concept is this inversion of the thing, what we understand a servant to be and what we understand a leader to be. Put them together, it has this ability to understand something in an inverted way. It flips it upside down, right? Um, it, you know, in the gospel tradition, you know, the, the way that man thinks, the way that God thinks, they're different things. So, oftentimes, the way God's message is revealed, the way the divine presence is revealed, is in this this paradox or this inversion. And so, the way it can be manifested and understood in the gospel tradition is the spirit of service. So, what about well, first, let's look at some of these terms. I'm just going to go through these and, and uh, uh, kind of like nail them down a little bit, right? So the first term we want to talk about is spirit. Uh, and the conventional understanding is just it's a vital principle or animating force within all living beings. Okay. I mean, what, what are, how do you guys understand spirit? What is spirit? Right? What comes to mind when we say that word? Right? Is it different than this? Something else come to mind? Anything? That's okay. I guess we nailed it the first time, right? So, but the way Greenleaf really wants to make it a particular understanding is in the servant leadership understanding, it's not just an animating force behind all living beings. It's an animating force that disposes us, disposes persons to be servants of others, right? So there, what makes us alive, what drives us, what moves us forward, what makes us alive? is also something that leads us to serving others. Now that's an interesting thing that's going to lead us back to this all or one kind of piece, right? Because this desire to serve others is leading us back to this unity, right? This back to this understanding of our interconnectedness, of our interdependentness, and the sanctity of all living things and all living beings, okay? Um, so there, it's, it, it's, it's a movement towards wholeness. So it's really no, no shock. It shouldn't be a shock, right, that, that this idea of wholeness and what it means to become whole is very similar to what we refer to as holy, right? Do holy people serve, right? What, what, holy people are, very, are categorized typically by what? What, what characteristics? What, what are they like? Hmm? Pure. Pure. Anything else? Self-sacrificing. Self okay, so other-centered, centered beyond themselves and something larger, right? Maybe the whole of, of, of all life. Um, God. You know. Gentle. Gentle. Absolutely. At peace. At peace, right? Okay, wise. So they have an understanding of the way things work, almost on an intuitive level. What's that? Humble, humble. I have this great understood. Somebody told me this great definition of humility once, and it's simply to, um, a recognition of the truth. And so, a humble person actually really understands their place in this whole. 
So when we talk about something, like, this is a little aside, but you talk about something like false humility, like, no, 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 I'm not good, I'm not this, I'm not that. That's kind of damaging because you're not recognizing the, the good that you're given or the strengths that you have. True humility is recognizing the truth and the truth that you have these qualities and you're a part of a much larger whole, right? So you never put yourself in front of um, the larger whole, the community um, of life, God, encompasses all those sorts of things. Um, so one thing that Greenleaf wants to talk about is this, an example of this is like if a monk is in a cell or a theologian is there in their study, they really can't be considered spiritual quite yet because to be spiritual means to be animating this spirit of service, right? So there has to be uh, a, a concrete consequence, right? So as, it, as he says here in this quote, a monk in a cell or a theologian in his study uh, would not be considered spiritual unless the fruit of their efforts finds its way ultimately to nourishing the servant, mot the servant motives in the world. So what it truly means to be spiritual is just not to know it, right? It's not just to simply call yourself that or practice things that look like it, but from your life and from the way you live, that animating force is leading back to um, the spirit of service that unifies us in the world itself. Okay? Uh, the next term we would talk about is just leading. This is one that kind of flips upside down at times, but um, a conventional understanding is going out to show the way. Right? The leader's kind of out there in front. Oftentimes looks the most important. Um, but in the servant leadership understanding, going out to show the way is understood in situations in which the way is unclear or it's hazardous or offers opportunities for creative, creative achievement. So there is, um, there's an activity involved that's more than just being sort of complacent and being self-important and at the front. Um, it's, it's actually much more of a sense that, as he says in this next little bullet, leading entails risk or requires a venturesome spirit or both. Simply leading the parade or maintaining the status quo does not qualify as leading. So we understand servant leadership, right? A servant leader, servant leader has a mentality that's of service to the whole, to the greater community. And so just sitting still, under, taking the world as it is with all its problems or whatnot, not being engaged in that, not being active and not going, um, putting forth efforts or, or actions that actually are, are having an influence on that um, is not leading, right? So, that, so that's, that's very important because well, how, does that, how do we typically understand a leader, right? By titles, right? What are some of the titles that when you think of leader, who do you think of? President, right? It's a position. What else? What do you think of? Hmm? Pope, right, what's that? The general. the general, right? Maybe these, these are titles that people have um, that distinguish them as leaders, but the true quality of leadership, according to Greenleaf here, is not gonna just be simply held in, in a title. Um, this is where it starts to get a little bit in, under, uh, interesting, because I know our culture has a very typical term, says, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And I, we really like the way that he defines religious because I think it reclaims some of the essence of it that's really powerful for us and isn't necessarily keep it in a box of, of the way that we conventionally understand it. So the, the root meaning of the word religio is to rebind. So again, that spirit to serve another, to put the whole of the community, of the world of life, of others in front of yourself, to bring that unity and to rebind, have some similar dynamics. But before we talk about what it means to rebind, there's some presuppositions about the way the world is that need to be understood. And one of the typical things that Greenleaf you know, points to, in fact, is that there's this, this word that he uses, alienation. Um, and that, that's compared over and against what it means to be rebound. So, to, I mean, alienation means what off the top of your head? Any, say again? Kicked out. 
isolated. Anything else? Yeah, basically, right? So it's, it's that one, that separateness, right? That isolation. But the reality of the world that we live in is that the world and institutions and individuals are always under this threat of alienation. Well, what does he mean by that? Right? They're always under the threat of becoming unbound, disconnected, needing to feel isolated, to behave in a way that is uh, individualistic or self-serving or and, and insulated, isolated, and separate. And that, that dynamic is, it can be, it very, as we know, it's very destructive, right? It's, it's like an egotistical behavior. Um, but one important way that he likes to talk about this, and I want to hear examples of how you guys see this in the world all around you, is alienated designates those who have little caring for their fellow humans or who are not motivated to serve as individuals or institutions and who, though able, do not carry a constructive society supportive role or who miss realizing their potential by much too wide a margin. Right? That's the alienated. Where do we see this in our world, in our culture? Okay, we'll think about that one a little bit. And we'll get into... Um, the thing I want to key in on is, why does he say they're, they're, missing, they're not realizing their full potential. By, they're, they're missing it by a wide margin when they're alienated. What is that saying about what it means? What is human potential then? What's it related to? What does it have to do with? There you go. And much like that term humility, it's an understanding that you're a part of a much larger whole. And to be alienated is to cut yourself off from the potential of who you are truly meant to be in this larger, interconnected, interdependent community, right? With others. We are with others. And unless we really understand that, that isolation can have some dire psychological consequences for us emotionally, but it also can have some pretty destructive consequences for our society if all I understand to be is that it's just me. It's all there is. Um, <clears throat> so, again, we come back to this idea that separateness, remember the idea we were talking about earlier, the, the hypothesis that we put forth uh, from one of my favorite authors in the orientation was just that many of the problems, if not all of the problems that we see in our society today he's hypothesizing can be traced back to this misconception of the self as separate. It's something in our world, our culture, that helps contribute to or as a result of this separateness, this idea that we're separate, that we're alienated from one another. And so we've cut ourselves off from this greater sense of purpose and this greater truth about who we are. Um, so that thus this potential is fully realized in caring, concerned, and connected servant role. Uh, one part in service to a greater whole. Um, just a little plug for St. Augustine's sense of like original sin, right? It's, it's that we're all born kind of, as, it's, as, as Greenleaf's like pulling out here, really under threat of being, we're fragile and we're fragmented. You know, we don't feel whole all the time. We do feel disconnected. And that leads us to do things that are destructive or don't, don't reflect that truer self, right? The self that is connected. Um, but one of the greatest sins of original sin, one of the greatest uh, vices, you'd say, is pride, right? And, and pride not just in the sense of, I think that I'm God, but much like Greenleaf says, why we, we're not achieving our full potential is because pride is also, for Augustine, this illusion that I am separate and that I am somehow more important. But what really is awful about it is not that it's an insult to God, but that it completely cuts you off from being able to achieve your full self and your full potential as a connected individual, as a part of something greater and whole, right? From God and of God and with God. 
that, that, that's where it, it really wreaks some havoc. So to be religious is any influence or action that rebinds, that recovers and sustains alienated persons as caring, constructive people, and guides them to build and maintain serving institutions that protect normal people from the hazards of alienation and give purpose and meaning to their lives. That's what it is to rebind, right? It's, it's to be a religious leader um, is to be one that is um, always looking to heal and to rebind. And why do we talk about that here? Because one thing that's kind of missing in our world, and, and you know, we, I know it's kind of a large conversation to open up, but much of why we have so many problems today is our individuals and institutions and our own culture so focused on the individual that we've lost sight of what it means to serve, why it's important to serve, and who we truly are. Um, it's the job of the religious institutions or anything that has this rebinding dynamic, right, to, to serve as that agent that's constantly calling us back, um, that's constantly keeping us um, reinforced, or as you'll see in a later quote, Im immunized, um, or that actually brings us back into a whole, right? Um, is this guy, is it making sense to you guys right now? You doing okay? You have any questions about what he means exactly in this? So I know this is a little bit, it seems familiar, but it can be tricky too, because I'm pulling out pieces and piece by piece here. So hopefully this makes some sense. Yeah. This is kind of a silly question, but who is this guy? Who is this guy? <laughs> this guy, um, is, he's, he's, you know, He's passed now, but um, he, for much of his life, he was an executive at AT&T. And he was, uh, you know, grew up during the 20th century. He's part of that greatest generation, if you will. And much of his life was spent in the corporate world. But really, he came to understand and seeing our own kind of culture explode in the, especially in the 60s, right? when civil rights and this upheaval and this complete turning away from distrust of authority figures was undermining all of our understandings of ourselves, of our institutions, of our culture. And so he came to understand what was happening was there was this critical failure of institutions or individuals to kind of be serving the whole and to function, this, function as this, this bind, rebinding influence for, in people's lives. It gives purpose and meaning and it calls us to something greater, right? Um, so he actually spent most of his life, this, the book that we took this from is, he developed a, this, this distilled idea of servant leadership. And that idea has been translated into many different arenas. What it means to be a servant leader in government, what it means to be a servant leader in the corporate world, what it means to be a servant leader at, at a university or an educational institution. So translating this idea, this dynamic, really, of service into different settings to show that when this dynamic, when this, this, this um, animating force that leads us towards a greater unity, Right? It has some really powerful consequences for success and effectiveness and, um, and the quality of human life in ways that our culture has forgotten in many ways. Um, because we, we've, we'll get into it in later sessions, but does that help? Yeah, no, I just, I didn't recognize the name, so. Yeah, that, that's okay, yeah. Um, he's credited with this. Many, many other people have written on it and contributed to the idea, but. Greenleaf is, is one of the first ones to kind of coin this term as, as an alternative way to, to kind of reclaim leadership. Because they had a crisis of leadership, you know, in the later tw um, 20th century. You do. Like, we still have it today. There's still tremendous distrust of hierarchies and authorities. And it's, it's built into us for good reason and sometimes for very harmful reasons. And to this day, there's still a crisis of leadership in many ways. And, He's trying to speak to that. There's a crisis in leadership because true leadership isn't being done, right? Because true leadership looks like this. It's, it, it, it doesn't look like the stereotypical conventional idea of the president and the pope, the person out in front of the parade. It's the servant, and we're missing that. And that's why we're getting into trouble right now. To 
kind of paraphrase. <laughs> okay. So um, for him, the reason we talk about it is it's important for us to understand why service council has this spirituality dimension to it, right? It's this, it, we all come from backgrounds and traditions that are very rich in being able to inform us and actually when engaged in the right way or participated in in a way that's life-giving, right, have that effective way of rebinding us, of healing us, of bringing back to ourselves um, uh, into a greater purpose, to our greater purpose. And so part of why we're here for service council is to explore that and, and, and how our that the religious language of, of the past can help inform that dynamic of what it means to serve, how it can deepen that understanding and make us more effective um, in, in understanding the sacrifices and the benefits. And in a lot of ways, truly, that it's a part of who we are and our deepest, truest selves. Um, I know this is very abstract, but the reason we kind of focusing on the religious pieces is because a lot of the work that we do if you go out and you're trying to be a social change agent in the world, it's very, very difficult. Um, it's a recipe for burnout in many ways, unless you have something to sustain you. The world, is, those threats that he refers to, when you're trying to take on the problems of the world, they can beat you down. They can fragment you. They can, they can um, really break you down. And unless somebody has something to sustain them, to rebind them, to heal them, to keep them um, whole and motivated and in touch with the spirit, right? That animating force inside of us, then that, those efforts can be lost. So our spiritual life has tremendous consequences for our ability to have social change and to have what we understand to be true and good uh, to be reflected in the world, right? Um, <laughs> back to some terms here. So uh, religious leadership, and this isn't necessarily just me in a religious institution, this means you guys could function as religious leaders if you're actually an individual who's seeking to do this rebinding. Um, is an action taken to heal or to build an immunity from two maladies? Two kind of things that, that Greenleaf thinks are really kind of issues in the world today. Um, widespread alienation, so this, this separateness that's can be found in most of the culture and between groups and um, individuals as a whole, and the inability and unwillingness of far too many of our institutions to serve, right? Um, many of them are actually, many institutions have a very self-serving motive or have a very um, narrow focus. And so that in itself seems benign, but for the larger whole, can start to have some very dire consequences, you know. Does anybody think of idea like what institutions that aren't that don't necessarily have service of of, of others as their focus really can create uh, issues? What are some examples of that? There's a ton of them. It's probably too many to pick, right? Just throw it out there. What are you mad about? Yeah. Well, how about like, a lot of the media, like not a lot. Of the media. Reality TV shows. What about reality TV shows? I don't know. I mean, I don't like them, so I don't watch them, but they seem to be all about like glorifying or random people that are on these TV shows. Okay, so it's, in a way, it's, the goal is to like glorify the self or the ego, right? To boost that up. So it appeals to that, that egotistical, self serving inclination that we have. And it just, so the media, in many ways, you're saying, or even the entertainment industry, kind of feeds that. Right? That's one institution that's not necessarily set. Um, okay, Tyler? Um, a lot of apparel companies that might use like sweatshop labor. Okay, so corporations that have you know, a narrow goal and discount the uh, consequences for others that are involved in their practices, like sweatshops. Caitlin? I was just going to say corporations in general um, are at least some um, mm -hmm. just having maximizing profits as that's the first priority. Maybe service is a priority, but not necessarily the top priority. That, and that, that's something that's really inherent in our culture. For you know, the 80s were the era of greed is good, right? And that's, that's how we build the economy and more wealth for others. But 
we're really finding, seeing that that is, is uh, not the way it pans out, and that just strictly profits as the end goal, right, um, is this kind of self-serving motive that, that um, leads to very uh, questionable moral consequences. And today there's this movement, you guys are familiar of it, is that, you know, sustainable businesses and fair trade and others have the, the three, uh, what is it, cornerstones or three uh, criteria for their business objectives. Do you guys know what they are? Three Ps is sometimes the way they're said. Anybody heard them? You know them. People, planet, and profit. So the businesses of the future that are reincorporating this social responsibility, this, this, you know, this, this greater sense of service and their role in the whole, those are the three criteria for their success, that, that they're taking care of people, that they're taking care of the planet, the environment, being responsible stewards, and that they're also successful businesses in the process, you know, and that that's not uh, an impossibility to do all three. So that, that's an exciting movement. So that's, that's something I encourage you guys. We'll learn about that later, hopefully, right? Okay. Um, so um, those two maladies that... It, it, basically, guys, the, the, um, the idea is that the religious leader is someone that is really helping to, to protect and promote against these kind of cultural forces or social forces or whatever, wherever they're coming from. Um, but the leader itself, a servant leader, is always a mutual relationship with the followers. It's not this necessarily this hierarchical notion that they have the power and they are the most important, right? A servant isn't going to look that way at their, at their followers, but they're going to look at it as a mutual relationship, and they have a particular role. So one of the bullets here, um, leaders are always attached to an effective force of followers. You know, they have people that believe in them, that buy into what they're saying, that, that accept what they're saying, and that are willing to dedicate themselves to their, to their message and follow them, trust them. But it's often because that leader isn't just as that last bullet says, the titular leader, the titled leader, gives continuity and coherence to an endeavor, right? So they're kind of that centerpiece, that anchoring point, but they are, but that endeavor um, is one in which many may lead. So again, it's a stewardship kind of role, right? The servant leader is one in which, yes, it's the title, but my responsibility is to make sure I create the conditions for all of us to lead. Um, we see, we see this paralleled in the Christian tradition and the idea of, of the body of Christ, right? So there may be a head, but every role and every part is necessary. and Every part has a function and is important and has a purpose that contributes to the whole. Um, and and that's, that's what the sense of leadership does. Okay. Um, next word, profit. Uh, does anyone want to read these? Cause I, I feel like I'm going to get you guys talking a little bit, you know. I'm doing a little bit too much of it. So... What's that first bullet? Anyone want to read it under profit? Oh, well. Um, servant leadership understanding. Although separate from a leader, but indispensable to her and him, the profit is one who has the ideas which, if implemented, will create the means for healing. There you go. So how, when you guys thought of profit, what have you thought of before? What, what's a profit doing before this definition? A Say again? Like a religion, okay, so again, associated with kind of a role, a voice, so what made a prophet a prophet before? That's okay, if you never thought about it, that's okay too. Billy? The biblical Mm-hmm, so there's always this voice crying out in the desert, right? And no one's following them because they're crazy, <laughs> right? But they have this message, that message is often this challenge to the status quo, right? So a true, again, a true leader doesn't just sit at the status quo, but they understand something more and take a risk towards um, moving towards greater and greater unity. <clears throat> the, the prophet is the one who has the idea, right? The idea that's gonna bring us back, right? And so that, that person's voice, that idea makes them prophetic. It means to be a voice of well, to, to, the ancient, you know, to be a prophesier is to be like a voice of God, right? 
That's the ancient definition. But the way Greenleaf's going to talk about it here, and the way we can apply being a prophet in many, many circles, is that it's one whose idea actually leads to healing. And that can be applied in many different circumstances. So it's important for us to think of like how we can be prophets, right? That this whole class is going to lead to that. How can you see yourselves and understand yourselves in these terms? All right, who wants the next bullet? Anyone? Um, to become a leader, a prophet must have followers who are often expectant seekers listening intently for a prophetic voice. And that, that's what I was kind of getting at. They're listening within, there's, there's seekers, right? There's, the, the prophet's a prophet when they actually have individuals. They only become a leader when there's individuals who will follow them. Otherwise, a prophet's just that voice crying out in the desert and they're crazy. But the leader has that effective group behind them. And oftentimes, with a prophet, it's a group of people who are waiting to hear something. They, they, maybe they're alienated, right? Maybe they're in that state of separateness and alienation, and they're waiting to hear something that brings them back, that gives them purpose, and that actually fulfills a greater sense of who they are. And that prophet is the one that kind of speaks to the seeker. Now, this is really important for us because this is where we are now, all of us. This is a very important idea to understand. And we're going to, a couple of, uh, maybe two or three council meetings from now, we're going to explore this whole idea of how we can be effect more effective in this and how we can understand it in a deeper way. Um, but religious leaders, they, they nurture those who are seeking this message, right? That, that, that rebinding, that, that, that bringing back into a whole. Um, Greenleaf points out that today, it, it, we have so few prophetic voices that we can point to, but this, I put this note in here. If anyone wants, does anyone want to read it for us? Just to get, us, get me stop talking. Gotcha. Today we seem to have few prophetic voices with us. It is possible that they are here and speaking as eloquently to the problems of today as the greatest of any age. The lack of our times may be a possibility Plasticity of seekers who have the critical judgment required to test the authenticity of a prophet. Is anybody listening? Right. So today, if we don't see enough of these, maybe, maybe it's not that they're not there. Maybe it's that we don't have enough people who are really seeking or understand what it means to seek or that know how to listen enough to recognize the message behind a reality TV show and the message behind a truly prophetic individual who's trying to change the world, right? There's these messages that we're bombarded with. But, so this is why I put this statement in here. What, why are you here at the university? Why are you guys here at college? Start listing them off. We don't have to have, there's no right answer to this, but there's a challenge inherent in it that I'm gonna raise. To learn, okay. Why? To get a job. To get a job. Very practical reason, right? I have to get a job. I have to have a career contribute to the world, but really take care of my own, my dreams and, and, and desires. And find, you know, I need the financial resources for that. I need to have a place. And sometimes there's status attached to that as part of the motivation. Why else are we here? To learn your place in the society. Say again? Ah, okay, okay, so learn your place in the world independent of your family. So you've been raised to a certain point and now there's this greater conversation taking place to learn about the world and who you are. To explore, your, to explore who you are, right, in a greater way than your family has been able to lead you to this state. I mean, they're the anchor, they're the root, but now the time is to explore and it's a time to learn. But here, this is saying, part of our issue today is if there are prophets, that are yet to become leaders because they need seekers and followers. It's because we all need to engage in becoming better critical judges, better listeners, people who can recognize the message when we hear it, and even have cultivated in ourselves the desire to hear it. Because if you're so far off that you're alienated and separated and have lost the care or lost that spirit, you've lost touch with the spirit that kind of animates your life, you're kind of, no, you may not hear those things. 
But our job here, especially in the university, is to try to cultivate that so that we're ready and that we can take part in this, this, um, this dynamic if we hear a prophetic message, that we can also be an agent of that. Does that challenge? Does that make sense? That's a deeper dynamic of why we're here, to learn to think critically about the world and about who we are. And that's not easy. And that's why we're here today on a Friday afternoon. I mean, you guys are ahead of the curve, so I'm not, I know I'm preaching the choir in many ways, so I want to congratulate you on that, right? Because you're all seeking something by being here. But we're just calling our, raising our awareness to that's, that's part of the purpose for us being here, is to continue to cultivate that, okay? Um, last couple terms, but this is getting back to like you and you, why you're here, why we're here. Um, seekers first, what does this mean? Does anyone want to read the, that bullet and sub-bullets for us? Yes. Prophet, seeker, and leader are extra, extra linked. The prophet brings good, penetrating insight. The seeker within the context of a deeply felt and searching attitude brings openness, aggressive, searching, and new critical judgment. The leader adds the art of persuasion, back persistence, determination, and the courage to venture and seek. Uh, All right, so that, that, that helps you understand the connection a little bit better about how, what our roles are. Now here's where you come in. Next bullet. Anyone? The prophet and leader are seekers and servants first. The prophet and leader, those who have this instrumental ability to change, to, to change the world for the better, um, to serve the world for the better, are first seekers and servants. And that's a part of why you're here today, too. We always have to cultivate being seekers and servants first. Those other things will evolve. Um, and we can, we're going to explore this to a much deeper level as the, the, the semester uh, goes on. But that's something I want to plan in as an idea today. Um, basically, there's some other ideas and definitions involving theology that he goes into, and that's, we don't need to get in them today. We almost were doing that, and that's simply getting a, a rational language down to understand um, what we're doing and how to communicate that. Um, I think for now, that's enough of kind of covering the bases. It's a little bit dry in this sense, but if nothing else, I want to leave you with that awareness that we are all seekers and servants first before we're ever able to step into the role of being a prophet or a leader. And that, that being a prophet and a leader is something that's much more accessible to us than we realize by virtue of these definitions. And that what it means to be religious um, isn't necessarily attached to the stereotypes that we typically have, but it's, it's, it's anything that has that, that ability to rebind, right? to reunify, to heal. Um, and so you can, you can have a lot of religious acts in your life for yourself and for others okay so we want to reclaim these things for ourselves so that we can learn from them and grow in them all right